This is a flavour of when you and then Ruth Armstrong, the missionaries from Sacred Lock, have just landed in Bahrain. You and Strange Mood persisted as they stood on the concourse waiting for Christopher, the man from the church who was coming to meet them. She clutched Anna to her and marvelled, taking in everything. The sweat and grime and cacophony of the night, the shoving, jostling, clamouring people, the muggy air thick with sand and cement dust, the curdled sounds of Arabic and shrilled sounds of Urdu, the men in long white thobes with red and white checked guthra hairdresses, the woman gliding past in long black robes and veils. It really did look as if they were gliding. A chattering flock of Indian girls, like birds of paradise in their brightly coloured saris and jangling bangles and fluttering chiffon headscarves. She pointed things out. Look, look at that! But Ewan was mute, impervious to her exclamations. When Christopher eventually arrived, he had been horribly delayed by the traffic, he said, pushing back a damp forelock with his wrist. Ewan greeted him unsmilingly, and Ruth felt embarrassed. Christopher shook her hand, his was warm and limp, and made a joke about fresh blood and lambs to the slaughter. It was in poor taste, Ruth thought, but she laughed back out of politeness. She felt Ewan glance at her and frown. For goodness sake, she wanted to say to him, help me out here. Usually, he had the right smile and banter for everyone, and she stayed demure in the background. But now it fell to her to make conversation. In the jeep, Christopher explained that it would take them longer than it should to drive back to the compound, because Thursday was the start of the Arabic weekend, when the highways jammed with Saudi boys who drove over the causeway to come to the nightclubs and hotel cabarets in Manama. As he spoke, she nodded eagerly, soaking in every detail, and encouraged him to tell them more about life in the Gulf. So he pointed out the monuments and the notable buildings. There, lit up and proud in the centre of the big roundabout, was the great pearl clasped in the multi-pronged tower, a symbol of the island's past, of course, and the pearl divers. But to him, a reminder of the parable in Matthew about the merchant man seeking goodly pearls and selling all he had for the one pearl of great price. That, in the distance, was the dome of the Al Fati Mosque, the largest building in Bahrain, gleaming green in the floodlights. They'd get used to the Muezzin's calls to prayer, he said. Five times a day, through loudspeakers from the Al Fati and all of the other mosques. The city didn't exactly grind to a standstill, as it did in other Muslim countries, and you could pretty much go about your normal business, but you couldn't ignore it. What he did was to lift up the name of Jesus each time he heard a Muezzin, use it as a prompt to offer up his own Christian prayer. He caught her eye and winked and laughed. In that direction, he went on, was the King Faisal Causeway, stretching all the way to Saudi Arabia, and that highway took you into the desert, out to where they were building a new Formula One racetrack. It was a pity it was dark that they arrived so late. Tomorrow, he promised, he would drive them around Manama and show them the sights. Even to this, Ewan did not respond with more than a vague smile, and once more Ruth felt embarrassed for him and for Christopher. Finally, they arrived at the house. It was not what she had expected. It was in a compound of eight or so villas, single story, surrounded by a high concrete wall rimmed with barbed wire and stuck with broken glass. There was a sentry box too, with a guard day and night, whose job was to keep watch of who went in or out to raise or lower the barrier. Christopher saw her surprise at the security measures and told her not to be alarmed. It was not a dangerous area, he said, and Bahrain was not at all a dangerous country. The crime rate was, in fact, incredibly low. People just tended to live like this, the well-off for the expats at any rate. Life out here in the Gulf, he added, was jolly good, all things considered. Um, at this point, Christopher and Rosa, his wife, uh, then show Ruth and Ewan around the villa and get them settled in. Um, so I'll skip on to the very end of the chapter. When Rosa and Christopher were satisfied they were settled and had everything they needed for the night, water in the dispenser, cartons of milk and orange juice, and even a bottle of wine in the fridge, Tupperware boxes of food ready to be heated in the microwave, they took their leave. Ruth lay down in the cot and managed to undress and change her nappy without waking her. The child had fallen asleep in the jeep, and it was a blessing she had not woken since, then went to find Ewan. 
He was standing on the veranda, gazing at the sky. The air was hot and thick, even at that time of the night. If you breathed too deeply, the particles of dust caught in the back of your throat. She coughed, wondered if they would learn to breathe the air without noticing the taste and the feel of the sand. Ewan did not acknowledge her. Sweetheart, she said. He did not move. Look, Ewan, she began again, angry now, but this time he turned and cut her off. We have to talk, he said. His face was grey. What? she said, but not here, inside. So they went back inside, and in the windowless central room, where he could be sure they would not be overheard, he told her the real reason he had come to Bahrain.